of a sand is a video game running in a web browser. They are running on Azure, they are using Azure Service Fabric, uh, they are using a few Microsoft open source technologies such as TypeScript or ASP.NET Core and also the Kestrel server which is Microsoft open source product but the top contributor on Kestrel is a developer from the company that created uh, the Age of Ascent. Uh, my name is Jacob Jedrzejczyk. Uh, you can find more about me at my blog jg09.net or on my Twitter, Jacob Jedrzejczyk. I also have LinkedIn. Uh, if you send an invite, I'll accept everybody. Uh, I'm software engineer at Microsoft, uh, but I work for the new Microsoft, and that's what uh, I want to talk, uh, talk about today. Uh, currently, I work on the Azure Management Portal, which is uh, one of the largest single-page applications in the world. It's really TypeScript, and it was developed by over 500 engineers working only on front-end, because the uh, back-end is uh, developed by uh, thousands of people. Uh, we are running on top of uh, many open-source uh, technologies. We are uh, mostly using TypeScript all the time there. We have Knockout, which is uh, open-source, created by Microsoft employee, but it's not Microsoft product. We also have required JS. Uh, we are running uh, partially on Node, partially on ASP.NET. Uh, and if you want to learn more about how Azure Portal is built, because it's a pretty interesting architecture, you can check out my uh, session from NDC London. Uh, if you Google for Azure Portal NDC London, yeah, you should find my session over there. Uh, and what is interesting, uh, we try out to run the Azure Portal in my friend's test lab, and, and it was working. And I think that's the future because now when Tesla will be self driving, you can drive to work and you can deploy the virtual machine directly from your car. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, oh, and also if you do F12, we have like cool ASCII arts. And actually, in this ASCII art, there's a job offer there. So if you, if you click the ita.ms slash build this, you will be redirected to Microsoft Careers directly to the job offer from our team. Uh, I mean, if you're interested to work on, on Azure, you can just send an email or uh, reach me out after my session. Uh, I can uh, save you like three months of recruiting process. <laughs> <laughs> you know, preparations, right? Uh, I live in Seattle. Uh, actually, I live in Redmond, uh, but in the Seattle area. How many people have been in Seattle? Well, everybody. So you guys all know how awesome Seattle is. I don't have to uh, tell you that. Before I moved to Seattle, I was a little bit like, and it rains all the time there, but actually it turns out it's not that bad. And there's a lot of bike trails, which I love because I'm, I'm a cyclist, I bike a lot, I do over 4,000 miles every year. Uh, and last year I started doing triathlons, and since then I'm encouraging everybody to do the triathlons because that's, I think that's the most healthy sport ever, and especially for us developers who you know, get paid for sitting, uh, it's, it's, it's very cool. And you know, nobody can uh, nobody ever told me that swimming is best for you. Like every doctor will tell you if you are injured, first thing is go to swimming pool. Uh, uh, biking the same, as, as long as you don't have an accident, uh, it's, it's only good for you. Uh, with running, some people claim like, oh, you know, but it's not very good for your knees, blah, blah, blah. But then I'm always telling them that uh, what's worse for your knees is not running. And actually nobody challenged me with this yet. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Microsoft and open source. So, uh, how many Dota developers here? Awesome, almost entire room, cool. So, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but we have, this, since the very beginning, we have the plans to make uh, the Dota framework code available for everybody. And uh, that was 2001, a while back. Uh, took a while. Uh, <laughs> And in 2014, we banked open source. And now, if you go to uh, reference source.microsoft.com, uh, where's my Chrome? You can browse through entire .NET framework. So, for example, I can say here concurrent dictionary. I was always wondering what kind of evil code can be there. And here you can, you can see everything. And what is even cooler, you can click and it will take you directly to some extract, key value pair. You can browse through it, you can go back. It's also awesome. even better than uh, browsing it from Visual Studio. And uh, so this is the all good enterprise framework. 
But what we are doing now, we are also building that cross-platform open source.NET Core, which will enable you to run your c -sharp applications on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And uh, what is cool with this framework, let me open up my console, you can actually have the similar uh, development experience like with uh, Node.js or some other, uh, or Ruby or some other frameworks. So let me make a new directory and I'll say .NET new. It will create me uh, two files. I'll open Visual Studio Code, the new open source uh, editor from Microsoft. And here I have two files. First is program.cs, so this is old, good, C-sharp, nothing fancy. And the new one is project.json, so that's the new idea how we want to make the CS proj a little bit less verbose. Um, and I'll just um, close this for now. I'll say .NET restore. It will download my, the packages for me. Because actually, with the .NET Core, you can have different versions of uh, .NET on different, for different applications on the same machine. And here I'll say .NET run. And I have my application running, I have hello world, yay. Uh, and if I do some modification to this code, a little bigger, now we can see a project log.json. This is the list of all my packages that got installed. Here I will say hello open source north, I'll save this. And if I try to run this, it will detect that the uh, file changed and it will uh, compile it and run and now I have hello open source north. Uh, you know, but this is, you might say, oh, this is on Windows, it's almost similar like with .NET. So, uh, let's do it on Linux. So, I'll connect to my uh, Linux virtual machine that I have hosted on Azure. Uh, I'm using PuTTY here. And I will make it a little bit bigger for you because you probably cannot see much. Okay. That should be fine. You can see I'm running Ubuntu 14.04.3. And here I'll do the same. I'll make new directory. I'll switch it to this directory. I'll say .NET new. And I'll say .NET restore. Boom, boom, boom. Same stuff and .NET run. And it's compiling. And boom, it's work. It's hello world from .NET on Linux. And you can even edit it with Vim. Any Vim fans here? Nobody? One, two people, awesome. So for these two people, yeah. I'm also a Vim lover, it's pretty cool stuff. Hello from Linux. And .NET run, and again, it will detect that I have a changes, it will recompile it, and it will run it for me. Boom, 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 come on, .NET, yay, hello from Linux. So this is this is on Azure, this is on Linux, you can do the same on Mac. Uh, yes, I want to close this, I want to go back to my presentation for a little bit. So, so now we have two choices, we can run the .NET framework 4.6 on Windows, which has a lot of APIs that are tied to operating system, or the .NET Core that has not uh, such a strong types. And uh, also on top of the .NET Framework 4.6, there is this uh, ISP.NET web framework, and especially popular is ISP.NET MVC these days. But now we are also building ASP.NET Core, which would be cross-platform, and you will be able to run it both on .NET Core, cross-platform, or you can run it on the old uh, .NET Framework 4.6. And what is cool about uh, ASP.NET Core is that actually uh, it's like a .NET app. So if I take my app here, so this app I just created, this Hello World with one program.cs file. Uh, in project JSON, I'll just add the Kestrel server. So I'll add Microsoft ASP.NET Core server Kestrel, and I will say 1.0 point, yeah, have IntelliSense, Woo. awesome. I will save this, and I will go back to program.cs, 
And here I will just modify a little bit my startup, my uh, static void main. So I will say here uh, host equal new web host. Oops, web. Oh, come on, come on. Don't crash on me, Visual Studio Code, not now. Ah, come on. Did I press the wrong button, maybe? Oh, yeah, it will not crash. Web host builder say dot use Kestrel and use startup. And I'll create a class startup in a bit. But here I'll say build because this will actually build the server for me. And if I say host run, it will run this server here. So I will create a class startup. And this class will have just one method public void configure. I application builder app. I'll come on VS Code. That's probably Camtasia. I blame Camtasia for that. It cannot be VS Code. I say app run. And here I'll just say that on every request, uh, return context, response, write async. So I can serve a lot of asyncs. And I'll say hello from open source north. So that's cool. I'll save that and I will add the semicolon here because it's needed. Okay, so this is basic app. Uh, I also need to add a few usings. So I'll say using Microsoft dot ASP.NET Core Builder. Oh no! Damn you, Camtasia. <laughs> All right. Hope I saved it before. Okay, awesome. Okay, using Microsoft ASP.NET Core dot Builder. Copy this because I need also HTTP and hosting. And hosting. Okay, and if I type them thing correctly, I'll go back to my console and I will say .NET restore because I need to install the Kestrel package, which I don't have installed yet. Awesome, looks like everything is fine. I'll say .NET run. Compiling it for me and it's running. And here I'm getting the localhost 5000. I'll go to my localhost 5000 and I have hello from open source north. Uh, and this is cool because if you want to build some lightweight stuff, you don't have to go heavy, heavyweight. You can just have this few lines of code. You can add your own middleware. You, you know, sometimes you're just building some. Uh, small microservice returning JSON, so you can add the Newton soft JSON here and you can return this JSON. Or we can still do uh, ASP.NET MVC. So here uh, I have my web application one. When I created the old good ASP.NET MVC app, but with uh, ASP.NET Core, and uh, there's also uh, Entity Framework Core, which is very similar to Entity Framework 6. Uh, but it's, again, cross-platform. There's support for SQL Server, there's support for SQL Lite, Postgres, and there's also a cool thing that uh, in-memory database, which is cool for testing, or sometimes it's useful for you if you just want to have some sort of uh, temporary state, for example, maybe versus the session state for your user or uh, some uh, solutions like that. So once the Visual Studio will open this for me, I can show you how it looks like. Dun, dun, dun. It's loading. Damn it, this Camtasia is slowing my computer so bad. Sorry for that. Dun, dun, dun. Loading. Okay, come on. All right, we are here. So, uh, so here you know you have controllers, you have models, you have views. Uh, how many people know ASP.NET MVC? Okay, like half of the room. So for the other half of the room, uh, 
I'm sorry, you will have to uh, check it out, but basically you have model view and controller there, and I hope you can follow up from here. Uh, so uh, I have nothing special here. Uh, there's one thing interesting is the startup.cs, but now in, instead of having this big web config file, you have all your configuration here in the startup. And here I'm creating my connection for my uh, database. And actually, uh, let me run this app. I'll say control F5. And I created uh, my model here. Oops, let me go back here. The model where I have my, uh, I have a blogs and I have posts, some simple uh, crude. Uh, and here I have my blogging context, which, which have two tables, blogs and posts. And if I go, this is that what you get by default if you create new web app with uh, ASP.NET Core MVC. I go to blocks. I have one block here, jg09.net. That's uh, legit. It's mine. Uh, I can add another one. I can say HTTP block.com. I can add it here. I can delete it. And all working. And how it's done, it's it's in blocks controller. Uh, it's very similar how it, how it was done in the previous version of ISP.NET MVC. Uh, so here I am uh, creating blog. I'm just adding this to my blogs, to my contacts, and here I'm just removing it. Uh, and if you want to find out more about the .NET Core or ASP.NET Core, now it's an ongoing .NET Conf. It's an online conference about .NET stuff. And today is uh, the last day, day three, but all the recordings from last two days will be available on channel nine. You can just go to .net, dot, .net, com, dot, dot net. Uh, It's all there. And if you uh, want to get started by yourself, uh, the best place is to go to dot, dot .net. Pretty cool name, right? It will redirect you to microsoft.com slash net. And here you can, for example, download .net core. And here you can choose Windows, Linux, you can choose OS X, you can even choose Docker. You can deploy also ISP Netcore with Docker to Azure, so on. And also a very good place is docs.asp.net. Uh, they have very good getting started tutorials. Uh, they have uh, very good overviews how to use the new uh, .NET, um, .NET Core. All right, so this is server side. Uh, we also have uh, some client-side technologies, and TypeScript is a type superset of JavaScript. Uh, this project was started by Anders Halsberg, the creator of C-Sharp. And actually what, what's, what's very interesting about this project is that it's not a new language. You can write pure JavaScript and compile it with TypeScript compiler, and you're fine because every valid JavaScript code is also every valid TypeScript code. And you can think about TypeScript as a actually super set of JavaScript VNets. So you have uh, JavaScript classes, you have JavaScript uh, lag and const keywords and all the cool stuff you want to use today. And TypeScript will compile this for you to a very unreadable ES6.5 uh, or ES6.3 if you want to. And uh, what I found recently when I went to uh, the GitHub, because TypeScript is on GitHub, like the, the same of .NET, uh, .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. And I, I checked the contributors, and what impressed me most is that the top three contributor is Anders Halesberg. Like, like I was thinking that, you know, like this guy is just, you know, sitting in a nice Oval office somewhere and just telling people what to do, but he's actually doing the real job. He's doing merging pull requests, He's talking with people on GitHub issues. Uh, I think that that's pretty cool. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And TypeScript has been uh, very su successful last year. Uh, so David did a talk about the, uh, TypeScript and Angular 2 earlier today. And this is one of the largest projects TypeScript is using. But also the new uh, VS Code is written in TypeScript and it's written on top of Electron, which is open source engine for doing cross-platform apps. And they're using TypeScript. We are using TypeScript on the Azure portal. Uh, there is also Dojo framework. They are also using TypeScript, and they are do doing version two. And what is nice about TypeScript? So let me uh, let me shut down my server. Let me create one more directory, tmp2. This name is legit, and I'll open Sublime this time because I can. Uh, Sublime has TypeScript plugin. 
And here I will create a new file. Okay, come on, Sublime. I cannot. No way. Uh, okay, I cannot create a new file. Awesome. You see, in code, everything was working. Uh, okay, so if I want to save this, can I save it? Yeah, okay, if I say hello.ts, boom, okay, here we are back in business. So uh, let me create a simple function called hello with first name and last name. And this function will just console log hello plus first name plus space plus last name. So this is pure JavaScript, uh, but you can already compile this with TypeScript. But you know, to be to be better, you can strongly type this. You can say, I want first name and last name to be string. And now I have a TypeScript plugin, so I can say control B, enter, and it will transpile this code to JavaScript. And I will open the JavaScript on the other side. So you can see it just take away these types here. So if this on the runtime, it's not strongly typed, but I don't care on the right runtime, I care during the development time. And what is cool about this, if you know, usually when you have a large system, there's one developer who have written this piece and then another developer who is using this piece. And there might be some uh, person saying, Dim. and let me recompile this. So now I have hello here, and I'll run this with Node.js, say hello, Jacob Jedrushek, everything is cool. But then, you know, like one day the developer one might come to work and say, okay, I want to make it better. I'll change it. So if, if in JavaScript world, this is what will happen. He will say, okay, I don't want first name, last name. I just want parameter person here. And the person object should have first name and last name here. And then if you run this, you'll get hello undefined undefined, no exception. Nobody might even notice if this is in some part of the systems that are not very obvious. But if you try to do the same thing with in TypeScript, if you say here person, and if you say here person dot first name, and you say person dot last name, and you try to compile this, you'll get a compilation error saying that this parameters does not match. And then what you can even do better, you can create a class person with first name, which would be string, and last name, which would be also string. And you can even create a constructor. This is actually all ECMAScript 6. Name, string, my last name, also string. And here I'll say this first name, this name, this last name, L name. And it's awesome. And here I'll say person. And here I'm getting great squigglies, but I'll fix it really quick. I'll just say person equals new person. I'll say Jacob Jacobshek. And I'll pass this person as a parameter here. And I'll compile this now. And it works. And if I run it, you see, I'm starting getting an uh, ugly code on the right side, but pretty clean on the left side still. Uh, and it works. I can also, you know, move this function into my class. I don't need a uh, keyword function. I don't need person anymore because I can just use this here. Say this. And now, again, I'm getting red squigglies. Okay, so something is wrong. I need to fix this. Say hello. I'm compiling this and I'm running and everything works. So uh, this is something that helps us a lot, uh, especially when we are building the Azure portal with 500 people working the same code base. If, you know, some person is doing the change, which is like even in a different building. Uh, that's the best way to communicate, you know, just crushing the build is like the message you cannot ignore, right? This <laughs> email can, can be deleted. Uh, and if you want to learn more about TypeScript, like last year I did uh, two talks, one uh, building large-scale applications with TypeScript, it's like introduction to TypeScript, uh, fundamentals, a little bit about Angular 2, how to automate your compilation of Google, and stuff like that. I also did a 
TDD with TypeScript, Angular, JS, and Node. So in the other talk, I've shown how we can build apps with Node and Angular using TypeScript, and how we can test these apps using Mocha or Jasmine, and also how we can do end to end tests with uh, Protractor. Uh, so check it out. You can find it on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Jacob or you can find it also on my blog, jbsjournal.net. Uh, so if you are talking about the web, uh, you should mention Microsoft Edge. Uh, it's not open source yet, right? Am I right? Probably not open source yet, but stay tuned. I don't know, but I hope. <laughs> uh, but what is open source is Chakra Core. Chakra Core is a JavaScript engine of Microsoft Edge, and recently Chakra Core became faster than V8. V8 is a Chrome JavaScript engine, and uh, the history behind that that I heard uh, why now Chakra is better is because the Google team that was working on V8, uh, they were moved to work on the Dart engine, so they uh, waste a lot of time there, I guess, because Dart, uh, I don't know. Anybody using Dart here? Okay, zero. Well, so uh, thank you, Google. So uh, uh, here we are. And uh, what the Chakra team did recently, and they did a pull request to Node, because Node is running on V8, they did a pull request replacing V8 with Chakra, but the ultimate vision is that you will be able to choose to run Node on Chakra or run Node on V8. Uh, and uh, what is a very important for TypeScript developers, because you can compile TypeScript, TypeScript is running on Node, so if you compile your code and we use uh, Chakra, you can um, have your compilation time faster, which is very crucial because we compile many times. For example, in, a, in Azure Portal, like if you're doing a quick build of our entire system, it's over a minute, and if you're, if you're doing like full build locally, it's almost 10 minutes, and we can make from 10 minutes uh, nine and a half, that would be awesome over the year for 500 people. Uh, so this is a, a lot of web, but now uh, most of people are going towards mobile, and Xamarin is an awesome cross-platform framework. Uh, Xamarin allows you to build both native applications with shared code, or you, especially for some business application, you can abstract the UIs as well using Xamarin forms. Because for example, in iOS or Android, you have buttons, you have labels, you don't have to write twice, so you can use Xamarin forms for that. Uh, but for uh, pure Xamarin, you can just build the native uh, UIs. And what is cool about that is that if you're already iOS developer or Android developer, moving to Xamarin is not that hard because a lot of, uh, almost 99% of APIs are the same. So sometimes uh, I was able to just uh, Google some solution for Android, uh, copy the Java code, to just uppercase it, and it was working uh, in Xamarin. Uh, and since uh, Microsoft acquired Xamarin, now Xamarin is both open source and it's free because before that you had to pay $2,000 per developer, which was a little bit crazy. Uh, and now you can use it for free you, with every version of Visual Studio, including the Visual Studio community, which is free. Uh, anybody building mobile apps here? Okay, like three people. Awesome. So for these three people, uh, I built a few apps recently. Um, let's see, my awesome shopping pad app. Like, you know, like I, I went to an app store recently and I wanted uh, some simple shopping app so I can, you know, just go shopping and I keep track of what I was buying. And then when I go next time, I to see what I usually buy, I don't have to like, remember what, what to buy because I'm always, I was going to the store, I was coming back and then like, damn it, I forgot the butter. And then, should I go back and get it or just live without butter for a week? So, I decided to create an app that will do this uh, tracking for me. And I did it with Xamarin. Uh, so, here you can see, I have three platforms. I have iOS, I have Android, and I have uh, Universal Windows. And what is cool about Universal Windows, that now you can build one app and you can run it both on the phone and also Windows 10. So, uh, that's pretty cool. Actually, here you have uh, four apps. And these apps has portable library that has shared code. And most of my business logic is here in this uh, shopping service. This is when all the management adding items, uh, 
keeping track of uh, what I am buying and in increasing counts is happening here. And I can test this logic with just one test project. I don't have to have separate tests per platform. I'm doing it here. I'm using XUnit. XUnit is well known, by the way, open source project created by Microsoft employee Brad Wilson. It's not Microsoft product. It's a community effort. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can contribute. You can use it. Uh, my fiber is C-sharp uh, testing framework. And uh, moving from Xamarin to Azure. So uh, how many people tried already Azure? Okay, almost half, more than half, that's awesome. So uh, as you probably noticed, there's a lot of services on Azure. Uh, our core products are, of course, virtual machines, there are websites and there are cloud services, but you can also build backend for your mobile apps. You can also use Docker containers uh, or the latest greatest is Microsoft Azure Service Fabric, which allows you to build a microservices uh, architecture applications. And uh, like recently, I was uh, playing a little bit with uh, you know what language, you know what program language is this? Anybody? Okay, the gentleman in the back is F sharp. So you you probably uh, should uh, get a sticker. If you want to, uh, <laughs> you, you guys all can have it after the session too. So, <laughs> so recently I was playing with F Sharp, and uh, I implemented my uh, one million dollar idea, which I will share with you. Uh, Stock estimator, boom. Uh, that's not this one. Uh, where is it? Yeah. I, oh no! Damn it! I clicked it. I'm opening something different. So now, oh. It's actually not that bad. That's my other Xamarin app, but that's not what I meant. Where is it? Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Okay. Let me find it. You guys know search everything? It's awesome. You see how fast is it? Uh, I hope I didn't remove this. So that would be such a bummer. Chum, chum, chum. Stock estimator, backup files. Uh, it doesn't sound right. Let's see, GitHub, stock. Here it is. Oh, okay. I hope I, I opened this guy. Uh, so I, I created this uh, small app with F Sharp because I want to learn F Sharp. And if you guys haven't tried F Sharp yet, uh, you should know. First two days will hurt, <laughs> but then it's going to be awesome. Uh, like I, I like it a lot. Like uh, if I can show you some cool code I, I've written with it. Uh, yeah, here it is. Awesome. So here I have my stock estimator logic, where I'm doing all the calculations based on the past stock prices. I am estimating what will be the future. Uh, let me open my stock data. This is my main module, and you can think about this as small microservice. Uh, and what is cool in uh, F Sharp is the uh, data providers. So here I'm using CSV provider. I, I am specifying the link to the API that returns a CSV file. And this is giving me strong typed API based on the uh, data they acquired from the API. So for example, here you can see I'm, I'm using a, a stocks load. I'm loading the stocks for, for example, MSFT. And here if I say X dot, it will tell me the name of the columns in the CSV file. I mean, that, that, that's pretty cool. Uh, and here I have my web API. Web API is written with uh, F Sharp Suave framework. It's very lightweight, lightweight framework. Uh, and let me run this. I'll do Control F5. And Suave will be connecting just to my logic and will expose the API from which I can get the future stock prices. So if it will run, I'll close this guy. This should help. Okay, it's up and running. And I also have my front end written with ASP.NET Core. And I am using Aurelia as a front end framework. I'm a big fan of Aurelia. Uh, you can, you can check my talk on, on my YouTube channel about Aurelia Framework. It's, it's pretty cool. 
uh, and let me run this. So I have my Suava server running here. I'm, now I'm running my another server. So I have small distributed system here. And I'm, I'm running it on top of uh, .NET Framework 4.5. And here it's loading and it's getting uh, the stock prices from the other web API. This web API is being calls to Yahoo Finance to get the past stock prices. It will take a, take a while. And here you can see the future for a few, few next days. But we can um, estimate, for example, what would be the price in, let's say, January 2nd. That would be interesting. Yeah, so this will take a while because I, I just started prototyping this project. I didn't uh, optimize it yet. I'm not taking advantage of cash and all this uh, cool improvements I could do. And then get a bunch of requests uh, in the back end. But finally, after the calculation will be made, you'll get the price for January 2nd, and it will be $56. So, uh, and, and you can see the trend is going up. So that means that you all should buy Microsoft stocks. Uh, and this F-sharp app, when I was first building it, I didn't deploy it yet, but the Azure Service Fabric will be perfect for that because what Azure Service Fabric allows you to do, for example, you can say, I want to have five nodes for my application, but for example, in my case, I want to deploy my, my logic, which is doing the most calculations, heavy lifting. I probably want to deploy for to all five nodes, this application, but I don't need five nodes for my front end or for my web API because they just, you know, sending the, piping the data over. So maybe I want maybe two nodes to have a backup. And Azure Service Fabric will do all this management for me. It will deploy to separate five and nodes, the five instances. It will make sure it will not deploy two instances to one node because it will not make sense because if this node will go down, two instances are going down. If you have five different nodes, then one instance, one node goes down and one instance is down. So uh, Azure Service Fabric is a pretty cool thing. Uh, check it out. Check out uh, F Sharp as well. Uh, and you can all. So use Docker with Azure Service Fabric, and uh, Docker is a very interesting story at the uh, Azure team because in uh, in Azure we have Azure Linux team, Azure Linux team. Okay, <laughs> all right, my impression. So you guys used to that. That's awesome. Uh, uh, and the the Azure Lin uh, Linux team, Ahmed Al Balkan, ported Docker to Windows. So now we can run Docker on Windows because it was ported by him and he uh, ported it during the Microsoft working hours. So Microsoft paid for it, paid him to do open source work. That's awesome. Uh, and you know, like our vision changed uh, recently. Uh, Linux is not a cancer anymore. Uh, it's pretty cool, right? Would you say Microsoft cured cancer? <laughs> yeah, that's what we should say, right? Yeah, that's what we did, right? Uh, and uh, you know, you can run Linux VMs on Azure. Uh, over twenty percent of our VMs are Linux, and you can also run a bunch of other open source uh, stuff and other technologies. You can run Node, you can run Ruby, you can run Python, you can run PHP, or if you really like hardcore, you can run Java. Uh, so I don't know any significant technology out there that, it, that it's not available on Azure. And the uh, SQL Server is coming to Linux, which is a pretty cool deal. I hear that now it's private, uh, private preview or something like that. And I hear that if you agree to ditch Oracle, Microsoft will give you two years of free SQL Server on Azure, and they will give you consulting services. I think this is evil because he's taking the customers from Oracle, but well. <laughs> but uh, maybe somebody like didn't calculate that, like giving two two years of free service like for companies. So uh, yeah, so if you guys want to switch, then you should do it now because somebody will figure out that they made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> what is also cool on Azure is our APIs are open, so we have RESTful APIs, you can manage your Azure services directly. If you go to azure.github.io, uh, you can, if you don't like the Azure portal, like one gentleman on the slide was complaining about the horizontal scrolling. Uh, so if you don't like the horizontal scrolling, you can build your own portal. You don't need to do anything specially. You just need to authenticate with Active Directory and call the API and 
as I create websites, scale my website, create virtual machine, create Azure service fabric uh, with one command. Just be careful to uh, test this correctly because if you deploy a SharePoint server farm by mistake, then overnight will charge you a lot. Uh, at Microsoft, uh, we have also this Microsoft Valuable Professional Program. And last year, uh, till two years ago, I think, it was only for people who were just promoting Microsoft technologies. But now, we also reward contributing to open source Microsoft technologies. And uh, on top of that, there are a few people at Microsoft who are doing open source that is not Microsoft. For example, John David Dalton. Uh, who is creator of Lodash library? Anybody know Lodash library? One of the most popular libraries uh, on GitHub. And he was working on Chakra Core to do this uh, super performant JavaScript engine. And then he, he took his knowledge and uh, thwarted the required JS, created Lodash, which has much better performance than required JS. And you know, some, some, when I was looking at this, some pieces of code in Lodash, and, you know, in for loop, he has something like, from i0 to i n, blah, 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 and then it's like i equals i. And I was like, why is that? Oh, you know, there's this thing in Microsoft Edge, they do this, they're doing an improvement, and then you can gain like 0 0.0.1 second. I'm like, <laughs> awesome. So I'm very glad that somebody knows this stuff, and they can do it for me, so I don't have to do it. You can just take advantage of this work. Uh, another cool project is Exunion that I mentioned. Uh, there's also Moment.js. By the way, at Microsoft, uh, there's one of the best daytime experts in the world, uh, Matt Johnson, who, next to John Speed, is probably the most knowledgeable person. Like, he knows everything about time zones. Like, he told me that, yeah, if you're detecting time zones, be careful because we know that in Egypt or in Qatar, it sometimes doesn't work correctly. Oh, and by the way, you know, in Venezuela, they're changing the time zone uh, about 30 minutes. So, you know, we can get it wrong for some users. So, it's always when I have some issues with time zone, I'm asking him and uh, he just knows everything. And it's cool that he put this knowledge and put it to, uh, into the moment JS. And there's also a small open source project, Voice Commander, that I, I created. And Voice Commander is on GitHub. You can go to JG09 Voice Commander. And here, I'm using Web Speech API. Did you know that you can add the voice commands to your website? Okay, so now you know. <coughs> so here, with this one command, you can add the voice command. Uh, for example, you can, you can say here, uh, home. And if, if you say home, then you add a callback function. And this function is getting called once <coughs> it detects you at home. And uh, it, it can do whatever you want. And I created this small website, Bookslip. And if I say start here, it will ask me if I allow to use microphone, because of course I would never do it without your permission. I mean, to be honest, I cannot. Uh, favorites. Top 10. Favorites. Search JavaScript. <coughs> Home. Okay, I don't know if I was spelling favorites incorrectly, but uh, probably didn't recognize them correctly. But so that's my like my vision how the future web apps can look like when instead of clicking, you can just say what to do because it, it happens very randomly. In the Azure portal, we have a lot of people that people cannot find the stuff because we have over 70 services there. And I was like, hey, maybe we should do a voice command. I just jog, and I'm like, ha ha, yeah, good idea, ha ha ha. And then I check out, it's actually doable. So maybe one day, who knows? Um, so we are doing a lot of open source there. We are also working with Rob Eisenberg, who created Aurelia, to make a good TypeScript story for Aurelia framework. And uh, I still don't know why React and Angular is so popular, but Aurelia is like still a little bit behind them. I encourage you to check it out. It's also a framework I really like developing apps. Uh, with this framework. Uh, you can, on YouTube, you can check my talk about Aurelia from uh, last year, or you can check uh, Rob Eisenberg talks. Uh, if you want to create a new web project, uh, I strongly recommend Aurelia. It's a Microsoft project. Rob Eisenberg didn't pay me anything to say that. Uh, I, just, I just like it. Uh, so uh, you can contribute to our open source stuff, like this gentleman from I just sent. Contributing to Kestrel, you can contribute to ASP.NET, you can contribute to .NET Core, you can also 
contribute to documentation. Because, like, you know, think about it, if, like, every developer in the world would fix some one documentation bug, it can save hours for other developers, because, like, how many times you, you are going to documentation and sample just didn't work, right? Then you figure it out, you never fix it, and then other thousands of people are doing the same. So, help us uh, to save some time, contribute. Uh, you can check more about the open source of Microsoft at our media blog. Uh, you can also check my blog, jg09.net. Uh, I'm blogging about stuff I'm doing after work, like the Xamarin stuff, so this apps, I, I did it after work. The same with F Sharp, uh, I'll go about Aurelia. But very recently, I also started the, the video series, Azure Portal Tips and Tricks. And I'm showing them some uh, simple improvement and hacks we did, some cool features. And I got a lot of uh, feedback from people like, oh my god, man, and you saved me a lot of time, I didn't know about this. And I'm also asking people like, hey, what, what do you want to hear about this? And uh, a few people already told me like, man, I don't know, you tell me, because you are there and you know what you are guys doing, I have no idea what your people plan are. So I'm exposing it here. There's already over 10 videos, so you can check it out at aka.ms slash Azure Tips and Tricks. Um, and you know, when I'm thinking about Microsoft and open source, it's, you know, it's, it's going good, something very fast, but it's going, and step by step. And I'm also thinking about the um, London uh, cycling team from Great Britain. Uh, they're at the London Olympics 2012. They won nine gold medals, and nobody could figure out what was their secret. And then they said that they did things like they consulted the doctors and uh, how they should to wash their hands, and the doctors tell them, yeah, wash hands like that, and this allowed them to be sick a few days less over the year, and this increased their performance by maybe 1%. They also figure out that if they take their own pillow with them when they travel, they can sleep better, and then again, improve their performance by some fraction of the percent. Or, they also figure out that if they will carry their bike to the start line, instead of just driving it on the ground, they can save 0.01 second of the lap, which, if you add it up, it's, it's a big difference in, in, in this sport. So the same uh, happens with open source and Microsoft. We are doing it all the time, but you need to wait to see the effect. I think the progress we have made over the last two years is, is pretty cool. And we'll be keep going. Uh, and uh, what I like about open source is that allows us to save a lot of time. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And recently at Microsoft, we uh, made public the cognitive services when, again, you took advantage of work that was done by, over the years by a bunch of people, a bunch of researchers, hundreds of developer hours, uh, and we expose it to the world so other people can just use it. They don't have to reinvent the wheel again. Uh, and what's cool, like recently, a few engineers across Microsoft across different teams, create a very cool product they're very excited about. And I'm sure you might be a little excited too. So check this, check this video. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well, or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised. 
20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take this. Hey. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. So this project was created not from a top down, but from bottom up by people from across different teams Sakib is working in London. Uh, there's one Microsoft research employee, Margaret Mitchell, and uh, one person from Bing team. They teamed up, created a prototype, used what was already there, exposed it, and now they are uh, building next version of this to make it uh, usable and do the public preview, I think, this summer. Uh, and I think this is uh, cool because it's a similar story, we can, we can do it open source. We can take what is already there, uh, improve it, and share it with other people. Uh, and what is cool about uh, working at Microsoft these days is that uh, Satya is mostly excited about two things now, open source and how technology can help, uh, can help to remove the difference across the people. And for example, Saki can function like a normal person across us. Uh, so it's, it's really cool to see that uh, you know, we can take technology and there are solutions like that. And uh, what is also uh, exciting about being developers these days is that we cannot can, uh, imagine how the future will look like. We can also uh, build the future with our already existing technologies. So uh, I hope that some stuff I showed you today uh, will be somewhat useful and you can take advantage of that. And thank you very much for coming to my session and uh, have a great the rest of the conference.